Now you're adding the ability to run apps on the platform. You have edge computing. You're doing a lot of data processing on these connected devices and you're creating autonomy. In today's exciting episode of Behind the Tech, we sit down with drone industry veteran and living legend, Romeo Dichar. Join us while we deep dive into the history of drones from the early DIY days when cameras were simply duct taped to drones, all the way to a future where they form a giant mesh network in the sky. Keep watching for a captivating story from a pioneer in the drone revolution. Ready guys. Romeo, welcome. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for coming. No, thank you for having I'm really me. Excited to have you here. So you quit your really cool job and started doing drones instead. Yes. And did you work for DJI then, or how did you get mixed with them? So it was it was an evolution. Um, obviously, there were also some drone projects at NASA, but we're talking large scale type drones that go into you know, hurricanes and stuff like that. But there was also a project where um, docking was trained to the International Space Station by means of drones. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I was very fascinated that, that you could use this, this commercial drone technology also in, in research and technology um, inspired environments. Um, but what really captured my fascination was aerial photography. Because suddenly for over a hundred years, we had taken images eye level. Yeah. That was our perspective. And suddenly, you can take that camera and you're in 3D space. And not only that, now you can create aerial panoramas, vertical panoramas, horizontal panoramas, things you, you couldn't do before easily were now accessible to the public. And I worked a lot with Adobe uh, to create um, tutorials on aerial photography and stitching images together mm -hmm. and all the fun stuff we can do. And that was seen by also DJI that then asked me to help them to develop, you know, features that, that everyday consumers can use. And soon thereafter, they launched the Phantom 1. Oh, wow. And the Phantom 1 at the time didn't have camera on it. The, you were supposed to put a, a, a sport action camera yeah. underneath it. And that's how you did aerial photography in the beginning. So it, it basically changed the whole landscape in robotics when the Phantom was launched. Absolutely. And it shaped, changed your life as well. Sounds like you were in the middle of already like thinking of photography as a means to capturing data back when you were taking pictures of the sun, then going back to NASA and the research you were doing uh, with the docking. And now you got drones and how did you open the or did they did they did i reach out to you or did you reach out to them how did that connection happen so um because of of all of this aerial photography that i did um they invited me to 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 become kind of like a consultant okay and i would go to conferences like ces for example and talk about aerial photography and in the consumer space and one thing led to another. They decided we, we, we need people in the United States. We need to open up an office in the US. Uh, Romeo, would you be interested? And here I was at this really fantastic job on, in, in the space environment, getting this opportunity with a company that had unproven technology that was really fascinating. And I decided, you know what? Now is the time to give this a try. Yep. And I did. And I started out in, in we, we called it education, because there were so many components that needed to be educated, from your general public to enterprise to lawmakers. Everybody needed to be educated on this technology so that we get, could get proper you know, regulatory environments, yeah. that we could um, make people more comfortable with drones and excite people to use drones but I had already in my mind that public safety will be the first to use technology because having a camera in 3D space, giving you live feed information will allow you to make better, faster and safer decisions. Was that because you, you, your observations, thanks to your friends and the work that he was doing, uh, that you thought that you immediately made the connection between public safety and all this data that we can use to help 
uh, the, the pool, like with drones? It was a combination. Um, I, growing up in Switzerland, you have military, uh, mandatory military service. Mm -hmm. So there it's always like, you, you want to have as much data as possible. What's behind that ridge? And it was always difficult to get that data. Um, then, of course, working in, in this um, re accident reconstruction space, um, meeting people in, in the public safety sector, it was a no-brainer to me that we got to get this technology into the right hands. Can you help us ground the conversation a little bit? When was this? Like year 2014. 14. Okay. So we're talking about 2013, 2014. And I joined DJI late 2014. And 2015 really started to approach fire departments, search and rescue uh, departments to start learning how would such technology get integrated into their operations? What kind of data were they looking for? And it was a challenge because you have this very set environment. Public safety works, you know, very slow. They have been using the fire hose. The fire hose was the big latest invention that they had at the time. And the upper staff in public safety, they're you know, close to retirement. They don't want to rock the boat, bringing in new technology, yeah. you know. So it was like a grassroots movement. But once we got a couple, three departments involved and started, you know, exploring what could be done, what kind of solutions they needed, it, it was like, it spread like a wildfire that we're trying to prevent with drones. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a good analogy. It was amazing. So you basically, and then like, because honestly, right now, I think that the technology in general, I think there's a lot of use cases that we haven't really figured out. But it's so interesting to hear how the sensor in the sky brought the concept of capturing aerial images. And then from there, you immediately capture like, oh, you know what? Public safety is the, one of the biggest use cases for this. And then you didn't stop there. You went to actually uh, public service officials and talked to them and convinced them and educated yeah. them thanks to the work that you did at DJI. So there was your role was education. What was your role at DJI? Yeah, so then from there, I moved into officially supporting public safety. Okay, so as a public safety, it started yeah. education and then public safety. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it was also very strategic because so now we're at a time where consumer drones became more, more you know, famous. Everybody wanted to have a drone and people were flying like there's no tomorrow causing some concerns left and right. Yeah, the public perception of the technology basically changed in a matter of months in yeah. 2015, 2016. And I think a lot of what changed is like the phantom landing in the White House. Like yes. that, that was the moment, right? Exactly. That was a big moment. And I happened to be in D.C. for a conference right when that happened. And I got called in because first everybody thought I was involved in all of this. And luckily <laughs> I wasn't. Um, but... Was You're, this you, Romeo? It, it was not me for okay. once. It was not me. <laughs> um, but yes, it was, um, it was so important that we strategically thought this through and worked with entities that could put a positive spin on the technology. And truthfully, you cannot argue with technology that helps save lives, mitigate risks. That's just bad business. If you start saying, no, nope, Public safety cannot have this technology because we have privacy concerns. That doesn't work. And so it was very strategic of us also to really target public safety. But obviously, um, we also believed in the good of the technology. And uh, Brendan Schulman and I, we both at the same time worked at DJI, and he was on the policy side of it, and I was on the more execution type side of it. And we would have these interactions where Brendan was saying, Romy, we need positive drone stories. What can we do? And I said, well, let's save lives. Let's save animals. Let's save old people that are lost. Let's save kids that are lost in the woods. And we did. And it really helped change the perception of this technology. So you mentioned you, you helped save lives. And I want to touch on you drones for good because I know you're a big advocate for that movement. Yeah. And uh, does that come from your background in public safety and your interaction with those officials? Or where, where is this coming for you personally? Yeah, it, it's, it, you know, once you see uh, a, a, 
a firefighter or a police officer or search and rescue officials use the technology and you see them operating and changing the way they're doing their jobs in, in a more safe and in a more efficient way, it becomes so inspiring that you just want to go to the highest building and, and, and yell to all the people how great this is. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to show across the globe the impact of this technology because this is not a, this is not going to go away. This is only getting bigger. But we needed to do proper outreach, proper education, proper engagement. And it was not just me. It was people like, like Brandon also that pushed on a much higher uh, lawmaker level that we got to the place where we are. So it became a global movement, basically. Yes. And so it, it happens with emerging technology that you find or you create the technology, you innovate, but then you don't really know what problem you're solving sometimes. And now you're still solving public safety. Did at some point your during your role as the public safety at DEI, did you go went back to engineering or product and say, hey, you know what? This is a new feature that we need because yeah. this will save lives. Yeah. How was that interaction within DEI? You know, that was exactly part of my job. I spend a lot of time with the engineering teams. And um, one of the things that we learned, for example, was having a spotlight and a speaker on a drone could make a tremendous impact. Not on every mission, but on that one mission you needed it could be the difference between life saved and not saved. And so I worked very hard with our engineering department to get you know, a speaker and a spotlight on the drone. And I remember when we first released um, the Mavic 2 Enterprise and it had in the set a speaker, a, a beacon and, and a spotlight, the reaction of the public was like, oh my God, They've lost their mind, a speaker in the sky, because they <laughs> couldn't comprehend why you would need that. And a few weeks later, we started seeing stories of, hey, um, this search and rescue unit was able to communicate with this stranded um, hiker and let them know that help is on the way. Um, this, this law enforcement entity was able to use the spotlight to shine into this vehicle and discover what was, what was happening inside this vehicle. You started to see these stories come out and it really reaffirmed the, the belief that depending on the industry, you may need very specialized solutions. I think it's a good analogy between the evolution of in the comparison with, between personal computing and drones and robotics. Like, yeah. you got emergent technology, you got a use case that you think fits what the technology is capable of, but then the industry really demands that technology for certain use cases that you were not aware of, and this happened in uh, robotics as well. Uh, you also were, uh, wrote a really nice article in, the, in Forbes in uh, earlier this year. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So. If, if you go back in time, let's go back to 1983, and the personal computer had just become this really cool new thing to do your personal finances, to do work pro word processing. It was this standalone unit, clunky monitor, big floppy disks where you saved you know, some amount of data and you had to take that out and you know, carry it around. And you look at the early time the early days of the drone, it was the exact same thing. You had this standalone piece, you had SD cards with data on it, um, you interacted with the drone um, by radio control stick inputs, just like you interacted with, with the computer keyboard. with a keyboard. So very similarities. And then something interesting happened. The internet, networking, and connectivity. So suddenly you connected computers with each other. You had data exchange. And what happened? You created a marketplace. You created an opportunity to quickly share data across the globe. And that changed everything. And so what we're seeing right now is that we're starting to see drones getting connected, not only with each other, but the moment you turn them on, they're online. And online can be whatever you mean it to be online, either you have a private network and they're all online getting you the data to wherever it needs to be or they're connected through LTE um, or a mesh network or whatever the case yeah. may be and they're sharing information with each other. Now you're adding the ability to run apps 
on the platform, you have edge computing, you're doing a lot of data processing on these connected devices and you're creating autonomy. Just like um, we have now smartphones that have more capabilities than in, in 1969 the Apollo project had to go to the moon and bring people back safely. The interaction has changed from keyboard to touch screen to voice control and we are at the point where autonomy is taking over also the drone and mobile robotics industry where we're not individually controlling a drone where we say hey device I need you to do this and the device will figure out how to best do it how to best get the data and it's all flowing into the same data pipeline so there is a so much similarities between where the personal computer started where drones started and where we are today and where the future will be so technology is basically evolving basically on the discovery from humans of the applications we can use for it and you're certainly helping a lot in getting the technology pushed that way how did you transition from your public safety role at DJI to uh, your current role at Altarian? So I, I decided that it was time for me to pursue this desire to standardize everything and I looked at many different players within the drone industry and Autarian was the one that to me was the most promising to bring standardization, to bring a common operating system in essence uh, to the market. And so I joined Autarian in initially with the idea that we could quickly also integrate into public safety. But what we learned, and that's one of the good learnings when you do proper go to market, yeah. you learn quickly what works, what doesn't work, and you adjust. And we realized, hey, we're a little bit too early for public safety. So I adjusted my, my position to be more on the strategic side. Mm -hmm. And we chose strategy because it leaves a lot of room to operate. But the key was to, first of all, bring the need for standardization for a true ecosystem where we truly bring in the OEMs, the sensor manufacturers, the app developers, and not only leave it in the air, but bring in ground robotics, water, underwater, so that we have mobile robotics that are operating on one operating system under the open source. And getting people to start buying into that, to start realizing that this is the future, because we know for a fact that not every mission or deployment requires a small drone. Yeah. Sometimes we need a bigger drone or we need a fixed wing airplane or a vertical takeoff and landing platform or a ground robot. And if we can standardize all of that, if we can create one common operating platform and one data pipeline, wow. It becomes easier to solve those problems that we keep on finding. And you're yeah. so good at finding those. So yeah. what... Did you already knew about open source when you joined Altarian? No, I, I was, I didn't know anything about open source. I had the same concerns that probably the majority of people who have never really worked with open source Let have. Let me guess, like, security. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, everyone, everyone can tinker and can change it and there is no good security because it's open. Yeah, everyone can see it. I can yeah. hack it. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to learn a lot about the, the open source and I'm, I'm still not an expert, but I have now seen enough to know that this is the only way forward, in my opinion, that allows us to quickly scale up not only the industry, but the solutions for either industry or defense.